founder and CEO of Reset Carbon of Hong Kong and Thailand. Liam got a Master of Science in Environmental um, Technology from London's Imperial College. And uh, today he will talk about what his company does at providing environmental impact, at, um, impact reduction to commercial clients within um, China and Asia. And also today he will talk about how the carbon strategy can help you save costs. So we'll come in. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Right. So I hope you can see the screen from your So really, uh, you know, all our business is pretty much done in Asia. And uh, what I'm interested in discussing is, you know, what's the what's really the value proposition to Asian businesses for reducing carbon emissions? And what we'll do is we'll, we'll sort of explore that issue with reference to some of the work that we've done. We'll show you some of the data from some of our customers and present you with some sort of thoughts and conclusions on that. Um, and I want to explore a little bit about elements of the value proposition. So typically what motivates companies to shift on these issues is, is a combination of cost savings, customer demands, and, and regulatory trends. Um, so I'm going to take that as a lens and kind of look at, at the markets that we work in and, and explore which of these are material or not and how they are influencing customer, our customers to um, reduce their carbon footprint. So it's just a little bit about us. We have a couple of offices, uh, about 20 staff are a service provider, so they're not an equipment vendor. Um, we essentially offer strategy, carbon footprinting, we have an engineering team that, that helps our customers um, you know, deploy energy efficiency programs and projects. Um, we've done, I should say, over, I should say implemented 150 energy and environmental assessments. But, uh, so we've been in business eight years, um, and we work, we've probably done 250 projects in total by now. Um, and our customer base is pretty broad actually, so we work for multinationals, um, a lot of supply chain stuff there, um, and also some, some large Asian companies, so Hong Kong listed blue chips, private health companies, quite a, a mix. Um, and really, with all of these guys, what we're trying to do is to you know, show to them that reducing your environmental impact and then particular your carbon footprint, uh, there's a business case for that. Once we've developed that business case, um, we'll, we'll help them implement it. So really the idea of value proposition, understanding current levels of performance, setting goals, and then implementing and tracking your performance against those goals, that's the kind of model that we're interested in. And obviously a lot of these companies will have their own strategies before they come to us and we'll just be helping them implement. But, but really our, our business logic is that this is a well, this should be, from a commercial perspective, a standalone good idea. So, so from, from as a business, um, reducing environmental impacts and reducing carbon should be a good thing. Otherwise, don't do it. Climate change. I'm not going to talk too much about this. I mean, I think that the bottom line on climate change is that science is telling us it's here. We're seeing impacts year on year that are getting more significant. Uh, the data trend is just reinforcing itself. So this idea that climate change is going to, if we don't uh, pull back our emissions, is going to drive some pretty horrendous impacts. I don't, I don't think there's much mainstream dispute about that now. And so that's kind of a background driver um, to a lot of this. Um, and we can have a chat about climate science if you like. Um, but, but really, from, a, from a, a business perspective, most of our companies don't even think about the details of climate change. They're looking at regulators, they're looking at competitors, they're looking at customers, and they're responding to, to that rather than to climate science. Um, however, that's what drives a lot of this in the background. But I think what's interesting about climate change is we've got a pretty good idea now about, about what we need to do. So, you know, broadly speaking, this is what happens if we don't do anything. This is what happens if we implement sort of current government policy, and this is where we need to go if we want to protect key ecosystems like coral reefs, mountain glaciers, that, that kind of thing. So the idea is really 
um, that, that we keep our uh, temperature increase below two degrees. That's a, that's a policy goal of, of governments through the United Nations. So the idea that there's a threshold, a temperature threshold that we, temperature increase threshold that we shouldn't be exceeding is um, essentially now part of the, the policy architecture and regulations that are being driven by that. So we have a link between a long-term environmental objective and a medium-term regulatory agenda. Which translates itself into something like this. Um, so what we started to see, uh, what we saw actually last year at the, the Paris uh, Agreement is a host of new carbon reduction commitments from governments that are loosely linked to this idea of a, of a two degrees temperature increase and preventing that. Um, and they represent uh, sort of policy commitments brought to the table by a, a bunch of governments. And what we can see here is a couple of things. One, fairly deep emissions cuts in some cases, so 20, 30, 40 percent, uh, and two, time frames out to about 2030. And so what's happening is the private sector is looking at this and going, right, we, we see a market signal here. Um, obviously, these targets are different levels of robustness. Um, obviously, some of them may not be implemented. Um, some of them may be, there's some uncertainty about that. But when you package it all together, um, a lot of companies are thinking, OK, it's better to understand this and think about how we react to it than pretend it's not going to happen. Uh, so the business risk now starts to come onto those companies that are ignoring the implications of this, um, and the business trend is definitely towards reacting to it. Now a lot of this stuff came out pretty recently, at the end of last year, um, and so we're looking at a corporate response to this that's still in a fairly early phase, but I think it's quite quite well defined. So I really want to talk about, in that, in that sort of overall context, what's the, what's the value of proposition of reducing the carbon emissions now? And you know, what is a low carbon company? There's an accepted definition for this, but for the purposes of this discussion and analysis, it, it's, some, it's a company that um, says, OK, climate change is something we want to do our part to, to solve. Um, we're going to measure our footprint, and we're going to report that. We're going to set ourselves goals to reduce our footprint, and we you will know, probably integrate that into a broader social and environmental program. So, so climate change on its own, you know, very few companies will only do carbon. It will always nest within broader programs that address other priorities that are um, material to that business. But, but I'm just going to focus on this specific piece as a piece of analysis today. So, you know, look at these three different issues. Uh, again, we haven't got much time, so I'm going to kind of top behind each of these and sort of show you some of the things that we're seeing uh, and how companies are reacting to it. So cost savings. I mean, cost savings for us is a, is a big part of our pitch. You know, if we can save our company money at an acceptable ROI, then a lot of other things become possible. Uh, if everything's going to be expensive and cost money to implement, then companies will be less Really plan. So understanding the nature of the cost saving opportunity and how material it is, I think is quite important for a lot of companies. And a lot of this comes from uh, energy efficiency. So I'm just going to drill a little bit now into, into this issue and, and try and show you, try and take, take energy efficiency from a bit more of a financial perspective and look at what it might, might mean for businesses. Because I think there's a little bit too much of a sort of a we look at energy efficiency in isolation, we talk about a building or we talk about a technology. We don't really talk about what it means to a company who might have a portfolio of assets and you know, all kinds of other um, issues that they have to manage and how this kind of opportunity can be, can be taken forward. So first of all, let's just look at some numbers. How much money is there on the table? Um, so, yeah, okay. so here is just some customer case studies, right? Hypermarket, hotel, dial, actual products manufacturing and so on. This is their annual energy spend. There's obviously ranges in these sectors. This is these are examples from our client base, let's say, which we believe are reasonably typical. Um, this is the savings opportunity that our engineers will typically find in businesses of this kind, and this is the, the sort of the Typical ROI if you implemented a portfolio of these measures. 
So I think what we're seeing is savings of 10 to 20%, ROIs of you know, less than four years, very, very typical across a range of different sectors. It can often get a lot more attractive than that. Um, but I think you know that's that's the sort of the a median case, if you like. And there's some variability, obviously, between sectors in terms of how the opportunity pans out. But I think, broadly speaking, a lot of this opportunity in the short run can be justified from an on-balance sheet investment. Um, in other words, the, the returns are, for many of our customers within the periods that they will typically use to make decisions about, about investing in their infrastructure, um, the confidence with which savings can be delivered is very high because the technical opportunities are have been demonstrated often for many years and are highly scalable. Um, so this represents a, a reasonable um, cost saving opportunity. And I think the key is this. So the, the problem with energy efficiency is that most people aren't very good at it but in house. Um, the service sector in Asia is not particularly mature. Um, it's quite hard to do it quickly and effectively from a sort of a starting point. And so there's a transaction cost, basically. And that, that may not be a financial cost, that may be a cost of your management time and your, your institutional focus. And that for us is, is the biggest challenge we found is, is that people really need to focus on energy saving in order to, to, to generate large savings. It's quite easy to generate small savings, but if you really want to do 20% per property across a portfolio of 50 properties and get that big saving, you've got to be pretty well organized internally and you've got to really focus and, and work with teams on that. So basically, if the spend per site isn't high enough, then the transaction cost kills you. So here's a cash flow projection. What does it mean? It's a hotel. Uh, so this is a Thai city hotel. Um, it's a cash flow projection for an energy saving program. Um, and again, what I want to do here is just kind of show you how that theoretical savings opportunity actually plays out financially for, for a customer. Um, so there's a real project in lighting, cooling, and then a heat pump. Um, and basically, there's a staged implementation of the projects. You break even in just under three years, and you, you've got a net saving of about 10 million Thai baht over five years. Not, not discounted, so simple net saving. So obviously, there's different assumptions you can build into models like this. This, for example, assumes flat electricity tariff. Um, so, you know, the, the detail of this is always up for discussion depending upon how our customers want to run these models. But I think the point is this is the sort of the order of magnitude of saving that we're talking about. And I think that's really, really important. That order of magnitude of opportunity is a real um, trigger point for our customers to move forward. The other thing that's important, I think, is most of our customers have got portfolios. So we, have, we shouldn't be thinking about property level, we need to be thinking about portfolio level if we're thinking about how much money a low carbon program can save my company. Um, this is a, a, another model, um, customer with seven, seven sites. Uh, again, hotels, different shapes and sizes, these ones. So we've got sort of large city hotels, we've got resort hotels, uh, also in Thailand well, and, and Southeast Asia, let's say. Uh, and, and here, what we did was we you know, took the results from one hotel and extrapolated them across the portfolio. So we didn't do certain detailed assessments. We basically took a conservative view about what was possible based upon a sample and just ran that model as an illustration of what we thought the portfolio opportunity looked like. You know, and here we've got just over a million US in five years of net savings across seven hotels. So again, that's really the question is, is a million bucks over five years for that company, is that a lot of money or not? Is that something that's worth going and saying, okay, I've got to build a structured program, I've got to go and engage my engineers, I've got to develop relationships with service providers in order to get this. And for some companies this is worth it, and for some companies it's not. For companies that aren't, you know, that have a high turnover in their engineering team, 
this is a lot harder than for companies that don't. So we'll often find that the ability of a company to kind of get the value proposition on cost savings is a function of, of the quality of their internal management system, uh, particularly in their engineering team, function of the quality of their skills. Um, and in other words, a reflection of the transaction cost of actually going and doing this. Here's another thing that we're starting to see, solar. Um, solar capital costs have come down a lot. Uh, this is some indicative paybacks that we've found from work uh, around the region. So what we're seeing is solar rooftop now coming in, certainly a sub-10 year payback. Uh, so Cambodia obviously the best because their electricity price is outrageous. Um, Philippines also pretty high. This is Thailand here. So you know, seven, eight years for a mid to large size PV system as it is now. Now that's not, a lot of our customers won't go for that in-house. Um, so PV is still borderline in terms of, is, you know, am I really going to think this is a valuable use of my capital? Um, costs are still coming down. And what, what we do with PV is once you stack PV on top of energy saving, you can get a lot, a lot bigger carbon production. So I think you know, when we look ahead, uh, PV stacked with energy efficiency, carbon reductions of 40 to 50 percent at the individual site level, aggregate ROIs of five, six years, that's, that's pretty much what we're looking at at the moment, which I think is not unattractive for many businesses. So customers in Asia, the confidence that we have in, let's say, B2C and in, and in, and in retail customers and, and the sort of uh, B2C customers' view on sustainability, most companies don't believe that Asians care about green stuff. So people aren't really spending a lot of time and effort designing products for B2C businesses. Um, if you look at the data, there probably is more demand there than we actually reacting to, but it's quite difficult to convince our customers that, that that's worth investing in. So we have had some clients that have done um, you know, garment products and things like that for the Chinese market that have had sustainability credentials and tried to sell those. Sales have been okay, but the idea that you can use sustainability as a tool for market share, customer loyalty um, in B2C businesses, I don't think people have much confidence in Asia right now. So that aspect of the value proposition is not very strong compared to Western markets or Australia. I would note that very few of our customers have actually gone and done a proper analysis of this. So very few of them have gone to their retail customers and said, what do you really think about these issues? Would you be willing to pay more? What kind of products or values are interesting? So there's not much good data uh, at the corporate level when looking at this. But our focus has been much more on B2B. So one of the things that we do for a lot of supply chain work, um, not all of these guys are our customers, some of them are, um, but what, there's a very, very clear trend that if I'm a multinational, I'm making consumer goods, um, a lot of my footprint associated with those products is in my supply chain, it's not actually in my operations. My operations might be actually retail and warehousing and logistics. Um, the footprint, the impact of my product is actually in my manufacturing or perhaps in my raw material. Um, the, these guys, in order to sell their products and differentiate their products in the marketplace, are now committing to essentially reducing the impact of their supply chains. This means that they are going to their suppliers and saying, we'd like you to A, tell us what your impacts are, and B, show us how you're going to reduce them. And if you can do that, we're going to incentivize you. So our most mature customers are now making are now factoring carbon performance into an allocation decision when they decide how they're going to source their product. Um, and this is still fairly early, but I think what you can see here is lots and lots and lots of targets. So I think what you see is across different sectors, lots of people are putting numbers on the table and saying we are going to reduce our supply chain footprint by X percent by date Y, and they're starting to report on that. So whilst I think it's taking a while to filter through down to suppliers, the intent is pretty clear and the market seems to be pretty clear. So we starting to do a lot more business in supply chains where the customers are beginning to push 
Uh, and we've done a lot of work in particular in apparel where this is actually quite mature now. So environmental scorecards, carbon reporting, which is actually been audited, um, and tracking of performance and then reporting that to your customer so that they can then um, measure that up against the, the, the public targets that they've got in the apparel sector and footwear um, is increasingly mainstream, I would say. It's not just the high-end guys, it's not just Nike anymore, it's, it's Target, for example. So that's where we think the customer piece has materiality in, in, in a, where you've got a B2B supply chain uh, customer who's got a target. And then finally, regulation. So come back to this slide. It's quite easy to be skeptical about these targets. Right? I mean, knowing some of the governments, knowing some of the countries, knowing some of the regulations that are already in place, these targets look kind of ambitious. Um, I think short run regulation is not a big driver on carbon for most of our clients and in most of our sectors. Where it starts to become an issue is where our customers are thinking a bit more strategically and a bit more long term um, because they're starting to see trends that they believe will continue. So regulation I think only becomes a factor when you start looking out beyond the sort of a five year planning period and, and, and doing a longer term piece of strategy. This is a, <coughs> one of the interesting things for me is this is IEA, uh, International Energy Agency Global CO2 data. What IEA is claiming is now that the, the global economy is, is decoupling. So in other words, we're seeing economic growth, we're not seeing emissions growth anymore. Uh, and that means that in some markets, it's, 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 these, these dynamics are really pulling apart. What that means is stuff is happening and on a fairly large scale. So what we are seeing is we're seeing a lot of investments going into renewables, quite a bit into energy efficiency, uh, and that's, so, so stuff is actually happening. Whether you believe the regulatory trend or not, a lot of our customers are seeing you know, physical assets and investments changing, uh, and they believe that there's a trend here that they cannot ignore. So the regulatory dimension is probably the weakest of the three value propositions, at least for the sectors that we um, do most of our business with, and definitely linked businesses that take a more strategic view on things. So I'm going to give you a case study of an example of a low carbon versus a non-low carbon business um, and perhaps a suggestion about why being a low carbon company for some sectors can be a really good idea. Um, and this data is, I mean, actually we've, we work for both of these guys, um, but this data is all public. So I'm just using reported data to draw some calculations and some ballparks about the competitive advantage that I believe Tesco Lotus has over the big C because of their low carbon program. And all of this you can just pop it online and check my numbers. But let's just look at it like this. Both of these guys have <coughs> a lot of stores, but they've got a lot of hypermarkets. So if we just take the hypermarkets for a second, this is roughly the number of hypermarkets each of these companies has. Um, we know roughly, roughly, a hypermarket will spend about a million US a year on energy. Roughly, obviously it varies a bit, but that's a reasonable figure. So, simple, that's the energy spend of each of these companies in their hypermarkets, roughly. Tesco so got a carbon reduction target of 50%, set at group level, which their tire business is implementing. And uh, at the group level, they've implemented 40% to date. The tire business numbers are not publicly communicated in the group report, they're not separated out. Right, let's say they're doing 20% in Thailand, for example, so that would be half of the group performance, only in hypermarkets, it's a pretty conservative assumption. That would equate to about nearly 600 million Thai baht a year in savings, resulting from this program. If I extrapolate that 20% to the big C energy bill, it's roughly that much. 690 million Thai baht as a fraction of pre-tax profit is about 7.5%. I think these two companies are going head-to-head. -head. They've got the same business model. They're targeting the same customers. One is low carbon, one is not. One is probably you know, six, 700 million Thai baht a year better off as a result of their low carbon policy. That sounds like a pretty good business to me. 
So I think one of the things that we would say is, for some sectors, not going low carbon is the question you should be asking. Right? If I've got a competitor that is visibly low carbon, clearly saving a lot of money, then why would I not go carbon? And maybe the question should be, is that really, you know, that, that's the question that should be asked. Obviously, this is a selected example. I'm trying to pick uh, businesses that are very closely comparable. I'm trying to pick one with a very visible program and one. So this is a kind of extreme example. However, we find this kind of thing popping up quite a lot. So if I'm Walmart, I've got a 20 million ton carbon reduction target. I'm sourcing fabric from two dye mills. One is visibly lower carbon than the other and can give me credits towards my program. The other one isn't. That's a pretty clear-cut business opportunity for one of the mills on top of the cost savings. So I think this is the lens that we try to help our customers look for. Where can I realize a cost advantage? Where can I realize a competitive advantage? Where does it make good business sense? We believe that if you just took this lens, just the pure commercial lens, we can easily drive 20% carbon reductions across many sectors uh, in a year. So that's really the, the conclusion. The value proposition works for some companies in some sectors and doesn't work for others. Um, it really works if you've got, if you have a valuable brand. In other words, not having a low carbon program and having a high profile brand, um, particularly if you've got sustainability reporting, that's going to um, get noticed. It'll get noticed in the way your CDP score is developed, for example. It'll be, um, as reporting systems move increasingly towards ranking performance, the lack of, a, a, of actually performing will, will, will show up. There's a reputational risk oops, for some companies there. That's not very many companies when we really think about the overall scheme. Companies with high energy costs. If you've got properties that are spending, I don't know, three quarters of a million US and up, and you've got a bunch of them, then it's probably worth the time and effort to go and systematically take out the 20% the three-year ROI that, that's available for you. If you've got customers who are clearly getting into this and are making public commitments about how they are going to reduce emissions from your business as a supplier, it makes sense to look at this. And the other thing is, if you've got planned investments into something that's going to be around for a while, like a commercial property or a manufacturing property, um, it really makes sense to look at this. Anything that's being built now that's going to say stick around for 30 or 40 years is going to spend most of its life in a regulated environment where there's probably going to be a carbon price. If you're not factoring in the carbon price when you're doing analysis of future operating costs and liabilities like that, you're going to be exposing yourself to risk and liability. You at least ought to understand how big that is before you make a decision not to do it. Um, so the biggest example we've had there is we we'll work for Hong Kong Airport. They have a third runway going in. It has a lot of associated energy consuming infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> it's going to spend most of its life operating in a world of a carbon price. This is a MSI index, they've got a portfolio of low carbon companies and a global portfolio of sort of reference companies. <clears throat> the only thing that interests me here is I'm starting to see these lines split. I mean, actually, the conventional portfolio is underperforming. That's not really what interests me. What interests me is that they're splitting. So at the beginning of this time series, they, they pretty much, you can't tell the difference. The fact that they're splitting now means that there is a difference between a low carbon portfolio and a non low carbon portfolio. This is a totally mixed, so it's not even looking at sectors where the value proposition is, is strongest. Um, this means that some people are already doing it and it's already affecting their performance. That, I think, for me, if you can see it at the global level and if you can see it in such a mixed um, portfolio of equities, means that within each sector, that split is, get, is, getting, is already getting stronger. We don't, these guys don't track to the levels that we would need to, to look at to see that. 
but this means it's already happening. And I think that's, for our larger clients, the biggest message now is there is a trend, it's evolving, it has long-term significant implications, you at least need to start thinking about it and answering the question for yourself, do I get on board yet or do I wait? Most people, when they actually look at that question, they won't wait in our experience. Thank you very much. I'll take the first question. Um, it's pretty clear that it's smart to go into this framework and do a carbon um, um, practice, but could you explain a little bit on some of the business of what are the investment and what changes do they do? What sort of technology? Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so for these guys, what I try to do here is sort of show you what the aggregate numbers look like. If I am a retailer, I'm a commercial property, a commercial building, a hotel, I'm basically going and doing lighting and I'm doing HVAC systems. That's where I'm going to get probably 70% of my savings. Um, so here, a lot of the <coughs> technology is very, very mature and very, very widely available. Um, what we recommend with our customers is you don't just go out and start spending money to begin with. You start actually looking, first of all, at how you're using energy. And you look, there's, there's always a low-hanging fruit opportunity, right? Um, so low hanging fruit might be just training your teams to uh, understand and look around their energy consumption and actually track your energy bill and make it visible um, to on-site staff and actually make them report it to the group level on a monthly basis. So you know, setting um, energy consumption targets based upon projected business volume, um, in-house in training for staff, will often get you 5%, for example. Um, next level up would be something like controls and automation. So in other words, where your system is performing, make sure it's performing to the demand requirements in, in, in your business. So if your room is empty, don't refrigerate it. Uh, if your corridors are not used very often between certain hours of the day, put a motion sensor on the, on the circuit. Um, that pays back pretty quickly. And then finally, there's usually a technical swap, so uh, LEDs um, are cost effective, i.e. two and a half year payback-ish for many businesses now. So Tesco, for example, will you go in and look at their lighting, it's all T5s and LEDs now. Um, in a hotel, you'll have to look at how often your lamps are on, but certainly front of house, back of house, corridors, everything outside the guest room is worth um, chillers, chiller is a very complex piece of kit. Um, they last a long time. Often, after it's been running for five years and you've done other alterations to the property or something like that, it's not performing optimally. Uh, recommissioning your chiller every five years will usually give you a 10-15% saving on the, on the chiller. We've seen that a lot in our customers. They don't buy a new chiller. You have somebody come in and check the set points, check the flow rates. Uh, and make sure the setup is optimized to changes in your property over that period of time. So a lot of what we try to focus on with our customers is essentially there's a, there's a payback curve. There's a bunch of stuff that will pay back at less than one year, there's stuff that will pay back at one to three years, there's big equipment swap outs that will give you big savings, but you're going to have to find 10 million baht or something like that to, to put them in. And what we try to do then is help our customers, once you understand that map, you can then make a decision about how to go and invest into it. And a lot of what our customers will do is they'll go and do the low hanging fruit first and track those savings. And then that's basically putting you in a net positive position which you can then reinvest. So our most mature customer on this is a university where we've actually created a revolving fund where we make investments, we track the savings, the savings go back into the fund and then they get reinvested back into the business. <coughs> Um, manuf whoops, sorry. Manufacturers, style mills, food and beverage, 
will have big uh, thermal systems. So whenever there's a big boiler and a steam system in a manufacturing plant, there's usually a great cost-saving opportunity. Boilers and steam is complex. Engineers are busy working on production processes. We're finding fantastic paybacks in dime mills in particular. We've been getting sub 12 month paybacks on like 10% savings. Um, steam traps, insulation, leakage management, um, boiler economizers, waste heat recovery project. So again, there's a sort of a stack of very mature technologies, lots of examples in the marketplace. It's just about identifying the opportunity and kind of showing it to the customer in a way that gives them confidence that it's real. And then when you get to the really big guys, so our, our biggest customers, other than some sort of large mills, airport and university, they've got a whole range of stuff. And, and often you've got mixed property types. Um, so then you have to segment the business into sort of sub-businesses and have a sort of a strategy for each of them because you won't have a sort of a, a, an equivalent technology mix across the whole thing. Um, so that, that demands a bit more kind of um, strategy rather than just kind of charging in and, and swapping out the lighting. But the paybacks are so good that it's worth it. So I mean, I, I think the, the other thing is PV. Um, you know, Thailand is, is, is actually really interesting for PV because you install so much ground mounted stuff um, for your grid. You've got a very mature installer community. And so installation costs are very low. So even though the kind of government subsidies are on hold, the, the, the payback in Thailand is pretty good right now for PV. Um, certainly for a lot, the, the problem with PV is do you have the right roof? So if you're a manufacturer and you've got a big roof and it's not shaded, you can probably put a megawatt or two megawatts into your business um, and that will probably have a seven year payback. The interesting thing also in Thailand now with PV is we can get finance. So we can just about now get a financial package. If you buy a four megawatt PV system, you will get a you can get a contract which essentially allows you to pay for the electricity that comes out of the system at grid parity. So that four bar kilowatt hour. You have to sign a 20 year contract. That's the downside of that. So the technology opportunity is maturing all the time, but I think from our perspective, the main difference is not you know, somebody who's already advanced, getting super advanced, it's somebody who's doing nothing, turning this into a strategic cost control issue. Once we can do that, the rest kind of flows because the, the business opportunity becomes clear. So we spend a lot of our time saying, how do we take a customer from doing the odd project to saying, okay, I'm gonna go and save two million bucks in the next five years. That, that's really the key switch that we need to make. Once businesses are alerted to the value proposition and capturing the data, they tend to start driving themselves. Does that answer your question? Questions? You mentioned, Liam, very interesting talk by the way. You mentioned the aspect of companies that are don't tend to just focus on carbon, right? Yeah. They tend to focus on packaging. So I wonder, you are focused on just carbon, right? So do you have to go in as part of a consortium or as part of a group to, to make your pitch appealing, or do you you still go off on your own, approach them and say, we're only going to talk about carbon? Yeah, it's it's a question. Bit from a business perspective. So I would say our business started off by being pure carbon. Now I would say we will in-house, we'll do kind of carbon, we'll do water. Um, we don't do any of the social stuff. Um, so we will partner where we find a technical issue that our engineers can't handle. What's interesting is from a strategy perspective, we can, we can do most of the environmental stuff. Um, so, for example, one example is in the apparel supply chain, chemicals become a big issue. Um, and managing a sort of red list of 11 toxic substances through your textile portfolio become a huge issue. Um, we have a combination. My strategy team understands it. When it gets down to the mill level, we'll work with a specialist chemicals management firm, a uh, specialist audit firm. So I think it's... 
I don't think anybody only builds a carbon strategy. We don't build only carbon strategies. We might get asked to build a carbon component for a big company like Swire or something. Um, more often we'll build something more holistic and then implement it with partners. I would say. And I think what's interesting for me is also we're starting to see more people combining the social and the environmental side into, a, into an integrated strategy. And that's where we would work with CSR Asia or something like that. So, Definitely it benefits us to be part of an ecosystem of service providers. And definitely our strategy is to specialize so that say this bit, we can deliver it. So whether it's, I mean water is interesting because it's similar to carbon in many ways. Um, however, the cost saving opportunity isn't so strong. So that's why we don't get asked for it as much. And water risk is even more dangerous than some of the carbon stuff. So, the, the, what I think is important in Asia is that that community of service providers gets stronger you know, and, and better networked. Um, we still have a pretty hard time finding good partners on specific issues. And well, when we found one, we're like, hang on to them for dear life. Um, because a lot of the services in Asia are technology thing. So it's actually a widget guy put a service on the front end of his technology package, but it's actually sales package. Um, we see that a lot in energy, for example, and that's a problem because the customer thinks they're getting a service, but actually they're getting a technology package. Um, we also find that a number of sectors that we work in aren't used to hiring consultants. So manufacturing businesses, they like to buy hardware, they don't like to buy energy management programs. <laughs> they're not used to it. So a part of it's also, you know, um, sensitizing companies to the fact that even though I don't get a piece of kit out of this contract, I'm still getting something that's valuable that's going to save me money. Um, so I think, you know, it can only be, and part of the reason I'm here is to sort of, you know, me anybody else that's offering these, these kinds of services because I think we, we, we probably need to collaborate. You, you talked South Pole, right? South Pole, yeah. You know those guys quite well. But they, um, we, we source a lot of our VRs from Sound of Hall. Okay. Anybody have more questions? Yes. South Pole's an office here. <coughs> South Pole has an office in Bangkok. Yes, yes. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Very, very active. Back there, they've been our go-to for carbon input for oh, okay. a couple of years. Hmm. They're not an energy management business, are they? Sorry? They're not an energy management Energy management. Well, what they, what they, what I understand, they tend to specialize on going into companies and saying, uh, "You've got this kind of this kind of product. Uh, we can, or this kind of yeah, this kind of product. We can take that uh, manure or whatever, and we can we can convert that into energy and and work up carbon credits. Yeah, that that's what they're. So they originate carbon offset projects. And that's exactly what they're expecting. Yeah. yeah. And what we do is we buy the carbon credits from those projects for our customers quite a lot. Because they have good, good projects. Sorry. Okay. Actually, my question is like this one about the carbon credit. Yeah. Like, I know that the benefit is just like cost saving already. But can you transform to the carbon credit from this one? Good question. Um, yes. But it's a pain in the neck. So uh, a lot of the methodologies for carbon credits have a fairly high transaction cost associated with them. Um, there's a fairly large amount of um, proof required when you're reporting to particularly higher value systems like gold standard, for example, which generates you premium pricing for your credit. So when we look at the value of the credits, compared to the value of the savings, and relate to the transaction cost of developing the credits, it's usually not worth it. In other words, the projects are usually not big enough. Um, so even a big PV project is probably not worth the delays that you would experience in pulling the whole thing together and installing it at five dollars a ton of CO2. I think that changes if the carbon price goes up. Um, and I think that changes if the methodologies get more accessible, which they ought to do as the regulatory environment matures. So 
So what we're seeing in China now is we're seeing cap and trade for some sectors. So immediately there, when you cut your emissions, it generates, you don't have to go through the whole kind of project-based carbon offset route. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the European ETF. So, so you can, it, it comes off your inventory and so you can trade it. So if we see more cap and trade in Asia, that's the way I think that the carbon value can be internalized into some of this stuff. The problem is if I'm in a hotel, for example, and I'm doing eight projects, and collectively they're saving me 1,500 tons of carbon, it's very, very hard to convert that. And then I've got to do another 10 hotels with a similar kind of mix. That's very hard to turn into a carbon credit project. You have to bundle the whole thing, which means you kind of need to do a methodology that's specific to that. And so it gets very complex. And it hasn't really been worth it. Plus, none of our customers understand it. So that's another thing I've got to explain to them. <laughs> Trading is still new in Thailand right now. It's, the, the, the CDM or, or the offset market is mainly designed for, I mean, there's not much, um, it's mainly designed for supply side projects in the way. It's mainly designed for energy supply technologies where you've got that scale and you've got you know, a lot of transaction cost anyway, rather than the energy efficiency stuff. I think that's what we're do we have more questions? Anybody? Yeah?